Well, if you are a student of uh, history and you like war history, there's a question that does seem to bother some people as they look at the different wars that have gone on, particularly in World War II. As you take a look at World War II, it ended in, I think, May of 1945, somewhere around May 1945, when they finally ended the battle. But from most people's estimation, it ended probably roughly around 10 months earlier. It was clear that the Allied forces were going to win, and Germany should have given up at that point in time. And so the question that they often ask is this, why did Germany keep fighting when they knew they were defeated? It's a big question. It was actually a, a book that tried to tackle the subject called The End, Hitler's Germany from 1944 to 1945. In fact, it's a crazy stat that about 50% of the German soldiers that died, died in that last year. Had they given up when they really realized that the, the cost was, the, the, it was a lost cause, what they would have done is they would have saved a number of lives. But why did Germany continue to fight when it was clear that they had lost? In 1944, in April, uh, the Allied forces met at the LB River. And at that point in time, you heard Truman say something like this. This is what Truman said. He says, this is not the hour of final victory, but that hour draws near. And then you have D-Day when we were able to storm uh, the beach at Normandy and we were able to get a great victory there. Why did Germany continue to fight? Well, from this book, the author said this. They continued to fight because it was a ruthless system built on terror that anybody underneath it was going to continue to fight under, and ultimately because of the man who started it all, Hitler, who refused to capitulate, who never would give in, and had a total war, all-out mentality that he was going to fight until he won. That is why they continued to fight, even though they had lost. If you were to talk to a soldier at that point in time, let's say from the meeting at the LB River when uh, when Truman said, hey, this is not the final victory, but we're really close. If you would talk to a soldier then who said, hey, look, the battle is basically won. I can just kind of, you know, let go and I can kind of just be more passive now. That would be a huge mistake because there were many skirmishes, many battles that took place after the decisiveness of the war had already been won. I think that's something that we as Christians need to think about this morning. Because why we do say that death has been defeated in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our sins have been paid for. There's nothing more for us to earn. Our, our punishment has been poured out. The wrath of God was put on Jesus at the cross. The Bible says our enemy is still fighting against us. And if we take a passive approach to this battle, we are going to see a lot of losses and a lot of damage happen. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to Colossians chapter 3. And if you're visiting, welcome to Compass Bible Church Tustin. We're not always this hardcore this morning. You thought it was hot outside. We're going to talk about the wrath of God this morning, okay? So it's going to get hot in the sermon. But guess what? We need that. It would be foolish for us to just pick and choose parts of the Bible that we really like, that, that make us feel good, and ignore the parts of the Bible that are going to make us prepared for the things that we need to know and do in order to bring honor and glory to God. And in Colossians 3, 5 to 11, I think just as I read the text, you're going to understand, man, there is a battle I need to fight. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 11 says this, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. 
What an amazing passage of scripture we have. And when you combine it with the truths that we talked about last time, when we go through books of the Bible, we go through them sequentially. We go through them verse by verse because that's where the power lies. When we connect the truths of the scriptures with one another to see what God has revealed to us. And last time we talked about the heavenly mindset that we must have. Because Christ is in his session right now. He has defeated sin. He is at the right hand of the Father. And because of that, we must seek the things that are above. That is our current reality. But it says one day Christ will come back. When Christ, who is your life, remember that, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And we use this phrase, already and not yet. Already we have Christ seated on his throne. Already he is victorious over our sin. Already he is ruling and reigning. And yet... He is going to come back and fully bring to fruition all the promises that he has made to us. So what do we do in the interim? One of the things that we do, our text tells us, is we fight sin. Now listen, you can go to a number of churches today and they might not even bring up the subject of sin. But it is your enemy and you do need to know that this is what you must be fighting against because if not, guess what? It is fighting for your soul. So if we're going to understand what it means for us to develop into the image that this passage talked about, for us to grow into Christ-likeness, this is not something passively that we drift into. It's a fight that goes on that's empowered by the grace of God and the spirit of God that he's given to us, and we need to be fighting it. In order to fight it well, we have to do two things. Number one, We have to identify sin biblically. Number one, identify sin biblically. Let's talk about sin the way the Bible does and identify it. Because when we talk about it that way, then we have a clear uh, thought and a clear focus on what we need to be doing as we pursue Christ's likeness as Christians. Identify sin biblically. How did Paul talk about sin? Verse five, put to death therefore what is earthly in you. Do you realize that as we identify sin biblically, we have to identify it this way. So it'd be 1A, if you want to write it down in your outline this way, you have to identify sin as your enemy. To identify it biblically, you have to identify it as your enemy. There are numerous passages in the scripture that describe the battle that goes on in the Christian life. Listen, there are a number of great metaphors in the Bible, right? Next week, and we're going to focus on one of the great metaphors in the Bible, which is speaking about the family of God, what it means to be a part of a group of people who love one another unconditionally, serve one another, pray for one another, care for one another. We have a one another in this scripture. Do not lie to one another. We have a great uh, camaraderie of of a family metaphor that is in the New Testament. But you know what's also in the New Testament a lot? A soldier. Like you, you do fight. That's what a soldier does. A soldier fights against an enemy, a common enemy. And we don't have time to turn there, but just write down 1 Peter 2, 11. 1 Peter 2, 11 says, Brothers, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Do you get that? There is a battle going on for your soul every single day. And because you and I are sojourners and exiles, that means this earth is not our home. Already we have the heavenly realities in our mind and we're seeking the things that are above. We are sojourners and exiles here. Do you know it's good for us to be under these tents right now? Because it shows us the sojourner mindset. This is not permanent, okay? We have a permanent home waiting for us. It's going to be built and we're looking to that. But right now, this is temporary. This is all we're doing, and we're trying to make the best of what we got here. On earth, all we do is temporary, live under tents like Abraham. We are looking towards something greater, and we're not going to let the flesh tell us to invest our pleasures in the here and now, but there and then, when we are with Jesus. But until then, the flesh is going to battle your soul. And are you ready for that battle? If you don't call sin your enemy, you're not going to do that. This is what you will do. You will coddle your sin rather than kill it. But if you call sin your enemy, you understand, I have to put this to death. It's a command in the scriptures. Put this to death. Notice it's what is earthly in you. If you remember back just up a few verses, seek the things that are above, not on the earth earthly, temporal, fleshly things that try to distract you from your preoccupation with Jesus who is in heaven. The text says you must put these things to death, what is earthly in you. Because if you don't put sin to death, 
It's seeking to put you to death. Do you realize that? It is your enemy. There's no like neutrality, okay? It's not like you and sin like sit at a coffee shop and you look at one another and go, oh, you're doing your thing and I'm doing my thing. You're on a battlefield. And if you don't take it out, it's trying to take you out. I was uh, reading a, a, a book review and it quoted a, a line from a Hemingway novel. I haven't read the novel. It's called The Sun Rises Also, I believe is the name of the novel. The Sun Also Rises by Hemingway. And it was a, a conversation between two veterans. One of the veterans says to another veteran, hey, how did you go broke? How did you go broke? And the guy came back with such a stunning line, obviously written by Hemingway. The guy says, I went broke two ways. First, gradually, then suddenly. I went broke two ways. First, gradually, then suddenly. And if you think about that, if you refuse to put sin to death, that is what's going to happen to you. You will gradually start to sin more and more, and then suddenly find yourself in a place that you don't want to be. See, King David didn't just commit adultery with Bathsheba because one day he woke up and he suddenly did that. It was gradually capitulating to the enemy and refusing to put it to death. So gradually he made his mistakes and then suddenly he fell. It is that important that you put sin to death because if you don't and you coddle it gradually, you will start to creep towards sin and then suddenly you will find yourself in a place that you do not want to be because sin is a persistent enemy. We have to take this seriously, identify it as our enemy. So what does he specifically call it a sin? Here we go, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. I, I hope I don't have to tell you of the dangers of sexual sin. Unfortunately, as, as a pastor, that's part of what you have to do. You have to counsel people who have been involved in sexual sin, and it is horrific. Sexual sin brings so much destruction. Do you realize that in these vice lists, the, the, the things that are bad in the Bible, that I think it's, if, in, if not in all of them, at least in most, that sexual immorality is the first vice that is listed by Paul. Porneia here in the Greek, which is found in a number of different spots, a, a spot that you'd be familiar with is Matthew chapter 5, 37 to 42, where Jesus says, hey, if you're struggling with sexual immorality, you gotta get to the point where you're ready to cut off your hand or pluck out your eye because it's that serious of a battle. Porneia, sexual immorality, it's anything that's outside of the God-given, beautiful relationship between a husband and a wife. So anything that's outside of that is porneia, sexual immorality. These words right here, impurity, are also often associated with sexual immorality. Sometimes they can be cultic impurity, but typically it's moral impurity. So we have moral impurity, and you see that in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 23. Don't have time to turn there, but that's another vice list where Paul says sexual immorality, impurity, and then he lists sensuality. Here, he has the term passion, which could be anger, but it seems also at times to hint towards sexual sin. As a matter of fact, let's turn to 1 Thess chapter 4, and we're going to see all three of these terms in regards to sexual sin. 1 Thessalonians, go one book to the right, chapter 4. We'll look at verses one to eight, and you're gonna hear all of those terms there are things that should be avoided and put to death. First Thessalonians chapter four. It says this, finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. That's a great verse on sanctification. We as Christians have been granted by God the power to live a life pleasing to him and we should be doing that more and more. It's never about pleasing him enough but striving to do it more and more. How can we do that? Well, you know the instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ because this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. There's one term that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust, there's another phrase, that the gen like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, another term, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man but God, 
who gives his Holy Spirit to you. We will talk about this more in the second point as to how we conform ourselves into the image of God's son as we are being renewed in that image, what that looks like for us. But notice this, if you're a Christian here today, you have the spirit of God in you, but what is the emphasis in this text? The Holy Spirit, which means I put to death, according to Romans chapter eight, the things of the body by the power of the spirit. This is not because you and I are so great that we're gonna figure out some sort of fighting technique that's gonna be able to allow us to slay the enemy. What it's going to be is a submission to the spirit of God through the word of God, putting the enemy to death. But do you see this as a reality? Paul, how many times does he have to write to churches to avoid sexual immorality? If you need any sort of help with that, it is not a shame to reach out. The shame would be that you keep it to yourself. The the shame would be that you do it in secret and you think it affects nobody. No, gradually it will happen and then suddenly it will be destructive. And what you will do is find yourself in a place that you do not want to be. You must fight sexual sin. If you go back to Colossians 3 though, Paul does something very interesting, okay? Paul's saying all these things, sexual morality, impurity, passion, evil desire, which... Uh, desires epithumia. We saw that in our passage as well from 1 Thess 4. So we have all of these aimed towards sexual sin. And then he says this, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now these four terms leading up to it, none of them have a, what's in the Greek, a definite article, the word the, which really specifies something. So it looks like Paul is setting aside covetousness as the impetus for all of these sexual desires. And that would ring true with the way that sexual desire happens. It comes from an inordinate, an innate, an insatiable desire for more than what you have. And that's what covetousness is. In fact, the Ten Commandments end with that. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't covet their stuff. This is something that is in the heart. Do you get and realize why you have to do external things in order to fight sin? I'm all for if you have struggle with sin and you need to put... Uh, filters on your computer to stop pornography. I'm all for external things. They can help, but they don't uproot the problem. The problem is found within the heart in the inordinate and insatiable desire for more, something that is not yours. The Bible says you have one desire, that is God, and that's where all your aim and all your worship and everything that you want should be found. But when you aim it towards something physical, like a woman or a computer screen, then it's that covetousness, that desire that will lead you to this. But it also does that with material things. Can we turn to Luke 12? Just look, Jesus warns against this. This is Jesus' words. We we should heed them. Luke chapter 12, 31. Luke 12, 31. Luke chapter 12. Sorry, verse 35, Luke 12, 35 to 40. 12, 35 to 40. Sorry, my pages are getting blown around here. Luke chapter 12. Sorry, here it is, verse, uh, where is it? Verse, the parable of the rich fool, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brothers to divide their inheritance with me. But he said to him, "Uh, man, who made me a judge or an arbiter? In verse 15, he said to them, take care, and watch this, be on guard against all covetousness. Luke 12, 15. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man uh, produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be married. But God said to him, fool, this night, your soul is required of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Do you see that your desires must be aimed towards the riches of heaven and following after what God wants for you and not the things of this world, whether it be material or a person. That covetousness will manifest itself in sin and that sin 
is so destructive. Go back to Colossians. Got to watch out for the covetousness of it. It's our enemy. We must put it to death. Look at verse 6. What else is sin? It's not only our enemy, but it's something God hates. That's letter B. Sin, if we identify biblically, is something that God hates. It says, on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Now, it's a simple point for us to stop right here and say this is a New Testament text talking about the wrath of God that is coming. It's not a correct representation of the Bible to say the God of the Old Testament is wrathful and the God of the New Testament is a God of love because the God of the Old and New Testament is the same God. And so when you have the expressions of wrath in the Old Testament, it's the same as the expressions of wrath that are spoken of in the New Testament, just like the love that's found in the Old Testament is the same as the love in the New Testament. In fact, you cannot have genuine love without hate, without wrath. If I am married to my wife, okay, and someone does something to my wife, that will bring wrath from me because of the love that I have for her. And if love is spited, just talk to somebody who's been cheated on in a marriage. That brings out wrath because righteously love was promised and then it was denied. You will understand that wrath and love can coexist when you think about things like that not just what make you feel good. God of the Old Testament, he does bring wrath and judgment on sin, the same with the God of the New Testament. The answer in the New Testament is, Jesus can take the wrath of God from you. And the sin and the wrath and the anger that you accrued, he can pay for it on the cross. That is the amazing mystery of the gospel that takes place. No longer are you considered a child of wrath, but you're a child of love in the family of God. But that means you shouldn't do the things that your father hates. Why would you do those things? If God hates these things and brings wrath on them, we want to, we want to avoid these things. We want to put them to death. Notice verse 7, in these things, here we go, you too once walked when you were living in them. That would, these things would describe what you were doing beforehand what your life was aimed towards as a non-believer. Maybe it wasn't all this explicit, bad external sexual talk that was going on, but notice how he transitions from how you used to walk to uh, now just maybe some more subtle sins that we might look at, verse eight. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. So you might be sitting here saying, okay, I'm not cheating on my wife, I'm not looking at pornography, but look at this list here too. When's the last time you got angry, had wrath, Malice, maybe you slandered somebody. Obscene talk coming from your mouth. Those are all things associated with the flesh, the earthly things that should not be associated with the child of God. And why do we want to avoid these ones? Specifically, here's letter C. Not only does, is sin our enemy, does God hate it, but it causes disunity. Look at this. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices and have put off the new self. See that do not lie to one another? That one another is stressing the unity that the, the church should have. That's why the Bible is constantly talking about the one another. We should love one another, care for one another, pray for one another, confess our sins to one another. All these things should be exercised within the church. And things that we shouldn't do, we shouldn't do to one another because the one another's are how we gain unity within the Bible. Look at all these things. So maybe like covetousness governed all of those other ones, Maybe the the idea of the mouth here governs all of these ones. Maybe it's just angry words. Maybe it's wrath, malice, and slander. Do you know that words destroy churches? Flippant speech, gossip, slander destroys relationships and it hurts churches. If you're a part of doing that, it is sin and you have to put it to death. It is what belongs to the old nature. It does not belong to the new nature and it grieves the Holy Spirit of God. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians four. Look at verse 29. Ephesians four twenty-nine. It says this. Let no corrupt, corrupting talk come out of your mouths but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. 
be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. See, we can point sins at people who commit sexual sin and it is very destructive. But do you just wipe it off your shoulder as no big deal when you commit the sins of the tongue? It's just as dishonoring to God and it causes great disunity in the body of Christ. You need to stop it if you're doing that. You need to confess it and repent. And you need to do what's right, which is to be kind to one another. Build one another up with your words. Forgive one another. That doesn't mean we don't confront one another in sin. You do do that. That's, those are the good things you do with your words. But if you're slandering or gossiping, it has to stop. It's not honoring to God. and It's grieving the Holy Spirit. These are all the realities of sin. Okay? Do you guys know the name of this gentleman who I read about? His name was Marius Els. You know the name Marius Els. You might have seen his picture on the internet because he owned a hippo. Like he straight up just owned a hippo. Marius Els uh, found this animal when it was about five months old as a young calf and adopted it. Very small hippo at the time, obviously for five months, but then the hippo grew. And what Marius Els says is, this is, this is my hippo, I'm gonna keep it as a pet. And he literally treated the hippo as a pet. When he was questioned on it, listen to what he said. He said this, I know it's a little bit dangerous, but I trust the hippo with all my heart. There's a relationship between me and Humphrey. He named it Humphrey. And that's what some people do not understand. I have a relationship with the most dangerous animal in Africa. If you're smart enough, you'll understand where the story's gonna end. The dude was mauled to death by the pet that he thought he could keep and tame. That's what it is with your sin. You get it when it's small, right? It's tiny, and you can, you can keep it. You can manage it at that point in time. Not a lot of people are gonna understand it. Maybe not a lot of people will know, but don't think that that thing won't grow, and it will grow to the point where it will kill you. It's what the Bible says. I read it this morning in James. It was so helpful just in my own quiet time through the book of James, and he says, let no one, when they're tempted, say, I'm being tempted by God, because God cannot be tempted with evil, and he tempts no one with evil. But when you are tempted, say this, I am being lured and enticed by my own desires. And desire, when it conceives, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully formed, brings forth death. That's what's going on. So will you put these things to death or will they put you to death? Why do we stress Family Weekend? Because in our small groups, we do accountability. Why do we do accountability? Because we want you to put sin to death. You're not gonna do it alone. You're gonna do it with one another. We're gonna help one another, pray for one another, care for one another, confess our sins to one another. And if you have that going on, you have a fighting chance against sin. If not, you're gonna watch sin have victory every time. Go back to Colossians chapter three. Notice what it says in verse nine. It says, do not lie to one another, seeing you've put off the old self, with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. What an interesting phrase that this now tells us our aim should be. So there could be this major emphasis where we are fighting sin. And if that's all we ever spoke about, that seems like it would be a very dour and maybe even um, just difficult journey that we're never gonna end. But the Bible says we are on a journey and that journey is towards Christ's likeness. And this text right here tells us that that's the reason why we're gonna have victory because we have put off the old man and now we've put on the new man and we're being conformed into that image. The text says here through knowledge. So number two on your outline, write it down this way. If you wanna develop Christ likeness, you gotta kill sin, identify it as sin. But number two, you gotta develop your knowledge to increase Christ likeness. Develop your knowledge to increase Christ likeness. Did that phrase strike you? when I read it, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. How would you have answered the question, how do you grow in Christ's likeness if somebody asked you? What would have been the first thing that you said? Would it have been knowledge? Is that where you would have gone? Developing your doctrinal understanding of the truths of the scriptures. Or would you have gone to something practical like show merciful things and do kind things, which are examples and fruits of becoming Christ-like, but you do not become Christ-like without knowledge. 
And if you refuse to study the scriptures, if you say that that is some higher level of Christianity and all I need to come in is just understand the basics, that's not what the Bible's promoting. Your increasing Christ-likeness happens as you increase in your knowledge of Christ. And to do that, you must study. Can we go to Hebrews chapter five, just real quick, just to look at this. Hebrews chapter five. Listen to this, Hebrews 5, 11 to 14. Paul says this, about this we have much to say, but it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Guys, if it is simple laziness of you refusing to open your Bible and study the scriptures, it is your fault and you are acting like a child. You have to quit that. You have to be a person committed to knowing doctrine. And the doctrines, when you study them, bring delight because you know God who is your one desire on this earth. Psalm 73, who, am I, who have I in heaven but you and beside you on earth nothing do I desire. So when you develop the doctrinal knowledge, you are increasing your delight. You are increasing with your joy and now you become more like Jesus Christ. But if you say, oh, that's, I, I'm too busy. I can't, you don't know my schedule. Well, I do know what's gonna happen. I know you're gonna lose your battle against sin. I know you're not gonna increase in Christ's likeness. But all those things that you have on your schedule, which can be good and important, will be handled correctly and for the glory of God when you maintain the priority of developing your knowledge. That's what happens. That's why we at Cummins Bible Church, we love to do what we can to promote that. Dwell richly groups, book clubs, all of these things. Now, please hear me. There is a wrong way to pursue knowledge. 1 Corinthians 8, 1, knowledge can just puff up. If that's all you want, that's a bad way to do it. And you will find yourself alone with nobody wanting to hang out with you if you just simply try to impress them with the doctrine that you know. But if you know doctrine and you love people, you're gonna be like Christ. You will grow to be more like Jesus. And who didn't wanna be around Jesus? The only people who didn't wanna be around Jesus were self-righteous Pharisees. Everybody else loved Jesus because they realized how great he was. That's what we need to do, develop in our Christ likeness. Notice how we can guarantee the victory when we're developing this knowledge. Why is this possible? It says we've put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, okay? So this idea of putting off is this idea of, of disrobing, of stripping off something and putting on something new. You could think about it in terms of, of, of a uniform, if you were fighting on one side, okay, and then you switched to the other side, you would take off the uniform of the old enemy, you'd take that off because that identified you with them. And now you would put on the new side because you wanna be identified with this side. That's what took place when you became a Christian. There is a decisive, definitive moment where you went from the domain of darkness, chapter one, verse 13, and were transferred to the kingdom of the beloved son, okay? So now you got a new uniform, okay? It's like you've been traded in sports. If you got traded from one team and you went to a new team, you don't keep the old team's uniform on and you don't play for them. You're over here now. You learn the new playbook. You get to know your new teammates because you're on a new team. That's what's going on when I'm putting off and putting on. You see the, the translation here, it says uh, the old self. Literally, it's the word man. And it might be better just to keep it man rather than self because we might be missing the distinction that it's trying to make. The old man versus the new man. Because the New Testament is often comparing the old man, which would be Adam, first man, plunged the human race into sin, and the new man, the second Adam, the greater Adam, that's coming along. In fact, we don't have time to turn there, but just write down Genesis chapter 3, verses 7 to 21. Genesis 3, 7 to 21. And there you'll see it's the section where sin came into the world and death came through sin because Adam capitulated his role as a leader, Eve ate the fruit, and now the human race was plunged into sin. What did Adam and Eve do first? They tried to clothe themselves with something. But was that clothing adequate to cover up their sin and shame? Well, no, it wasn't. In fact, God had to come in and make them new clothes. So literally, they stripped off what they tried to do to cover it, 
and then they put on what God gave them, using the exact same word in the, in the Septuagint that we have here of putting on something new when God is covering you. It again goes back to that distinction we were making last week. Man-made religion focuses on man's achievement to gain him something in heaven. But Christianity is focused on Christ's achievement and how then that impacts our lives here on this earth. If God has clothed, clothed you in the new man, this is what we need to be focused on. on. So now we have put this away, okay? And now we've put on this new idea. This is a constant idea in the New Testament. Let's go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, verses uh, 17 to 21. Just great verses here. You might be saying, okay, if I, if I want to develop my knowledge and I'm fighting against sin, what can I do? I think if you took a passage like this and you prayed through it, meditated on it, and applied it, it would do what the passage is telling you to do. Notice what it says. Now this I say in testifying the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Okay, see that word learned right there? That's the verb form of the noun for disciple, okay? So we never get out of the verbiage of discipleship. I wanna stress that to you. A lot of people think because disciple doesn't appear in the epistles that we, we don't need to talk about that anymore. No, Christ told us to make disciples and there's so many times that this verb takes place in the New Testament about how we are to learn things because that is the definition of a disciple, a student striving to be like the savior who saved him. We're, we're being increasingly conformed to the image of our master. What did Jesus say? A disciple, when he's fully formed, will be like his master. So you being here means you have to study to be more like Jesus. But studying is not just intellectual knowledge. Notice all the stuff about their mind and how you learned Christ. Notice what they need to do. Verse 21, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off the old self or old man, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness, in holiness. So your mind must increase, your understanding of doctrine must grow, the teaching, the learning, that all has to be there, but then it must be put into practice as the fruit of that is blessing the body of Christ and growing more to be like Jesus. Notice how it happens if you drop down to verse 28, okay? Let the thief no longer steal but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone who's in need. So if I'm to take the passage that we just read, 17 to 24, and I were to say, what does that look like practically? It would look like what the thief is doing here. I was a thief. That's what I used to be. Not anymore. I'm in Christ. So Christ has told me to work with my hands and I don't just work with my hands so I can build up stuff for myself. I used to take things from people. Now I'm gonna build things up so I can give things to people. And that is how discipleship works because now you're living like Jesus who came not to be served, but to serve. So the practicality of discipleship happens when you live out the doctrine that you are studying. That's putting off the old and putting on the new. Back to Colossians. Again, just note that. It is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. That idea of being renewed into the image of Christ is the goal of your salvation, Romans 8, 29. But it is a lifelong process. Can you write down 2 Corinthians? Actually, let's just turn there. It's probably better to just turn there. 2 Corinthians, you can write it down too if you want. I don't care. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. We're gonna look all the way to chapter four, verse 17. Hopping along the way. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, or 17. All the way to... Uh, 4, 16 through 18. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 says this. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unfailed face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the spirit. Do you realize why we can approach 
our battle against sin, not as victims, but with a victorious mindset is because we have the spirit of God in us who is transforming us from one degree of glory to another. It is not based on our power. That's why we know it's gonna happen. Look at four, verse seven. We have in this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. That's why this is gonna happen because God is great, you're not. And when you depend on him, then his work will be done. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. He empowers us to put sin to death. We hate it more and more. He gives us the spirit of God and the word of God to conform us to the image of the son of God for the glory of God. That's why we have this victorious mindset. We overcome the world. Did we not read that this morning? Greater is he who's in us than he who is in the world. Stop acting like a victim. You are not. What you have is the power of the victorious spirit behind all of your efforts. You just have to depend or walk in the spirit. And then you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Don't talk like you're a victim. Talk like God is powerful and you can be victorious when you depend on him. Then he gets the glory, which is what he wants from us. Look at chapter four, verses 16 to 18. We do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look to the things that are not seen, that are seen, uh, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. See that we're renewed day by day. This is gonna happen as a daily pursuit, going after Christ-likeness in all that you do. Back to Colossians chapter two. We have put off the old self. We put on the new, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, which chapter one, verses 15 and 16 told us was Christ. But notice where he ends up here. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. What a, what a great way to end the, this passage. Christ is all and in all. This, these lists and descriptions are so helpful today. Listen, if you get to a realm of teaching that is highlighting something that is externally observable as the most important thing about a person, you're listening to a false teaching. That's a man-made religion. Notice what this is saying. You shouldn't focus on somebody's ethnicity, right? It's not Jew or Greek. You shouldn't focus on their religious standing, circumcised or uncircumcised. You shouldn't focus on their social standing, barbarian or Scythian. You shouldn't focus on their economic status, slave or free. Why? Because all that matters is that Christ is all and that he's in all. So whatever background you come from doesn't matter. Every tribe, tongue, and nation will bow the knee to Jesus Christ. So what we focus on is gospel proclamation to see gospel transformation for the honor and glory of God. If you're listening to systems that are telling you we gotta focus on the external things, that's worldly and man-made. What we want to do is focus that Christ is all, meaning he's preeminent. He's told us he is Lord and therefore he's in all. It doesn't matter age, size, weight, which is good for a lot of us, right? That doesn't matter, okay? God is going to be in all of us if you bow the knee to Jesus Christ. What a great thought to have. This is what it takes to fight against sin. It's a struggle. It's a battle. But we have to be faithful to the end. I don't know how many of you know the name Fred Merkel. You might know it if you're a baseball fan. Way back in the day, he played for the Giants. They were playing the Chicago Cubs. It was in the World Series. He's on first base, and the, the game-winning run is on third base. A guy hits it, the winning run comes in, and the crowd goes nuts, okay? The winning run has just scored. The crowd's storming the field. Fred Merkel is on first base, sees the crowds coming, and instead of doing what he should have done according to the rules, run from first to second, he left the field and never completed the run to second base, which means there's a force out at second base. And if you know baseball rules at all, if you throw the ball and get a force out as the last out, doesn't matter what runs come in at all. So Fred Merkel didn't go to second base. The Chicago Cubs saw that, appealed to the umpire, stepped on second base, caused a force out, and the winning run ended up not counting the Giants ended up losing that game later on because Fred Merkel just didn't follow the command that he was supposed to do all the way to the end. 
Think about it. It wasn't him scoring the winning run. That had already been scored. All he was simply called to do was follow the rule, go to first or second base, and that's it. I think there's some similarities between the already and not yet of the Christian life. Winning run's been scored, not by us, by Christ. All we're called to do, first base to second base, follow the rules and make sure we get there. And when we get there by the power of God, for the glory of God, we celebrate rightfully because we followed the commands that God has laid down for us. Because let's be a church that's committed to doing that and helping one another to do that. All for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you this morning to allow us to look at words that um, can be hard at times, Father, but are sobering and good for us. God, if I was an army general and we were about to go face an enemy and I told the people not to, not to worry about it, just kind of go out there and feel your way through it, I would be an unworthy general. Father, I pray this morning that I've done what you've called me to do. And I pray first it would make an impact in my life so I would see sin put to death and I would see Christ increase in me. And then as that happens in me, it happens increasingly in our people so that the church grows to be more like Jesus Christ. So Father, for your honor and glory, will you help us to grow deeper in the knowledge of who Jesus is so that we long to be more like him and by the power of the Spirit of God putting sin to death in our life, we would see increasing Christ-likeness happen. God, when that happens, there will be so much joy because we'll be doing the things that are pleasing to you. So help us to long for the right realities. Help us not to covet anything on this earth, but to covet your glory. And we pray this all in your son's glorious name. Amen.